welcoming debate, the Honourable Verver Crowfoot. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It is uh, an honour to be able to stand in this House for the first time. And uh, uh, before I get into what will be a list of thank yous, I want to reflect just a brief moment to the first time when uh, my wife and I, after getting elected, we flew here during one of the orientation days. And although I had been to this chamber and many times to the chamber in the center block, it was an incredible experience to walk in to, uh, the, onto the floor of this house to the very epicenter of Canadian democracy. To see that so clearly demonstrated through the, uh, the traditions represented, the desks, the, the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the very carpet, and all that that means, it truly was a humbling experience, the burden that all 338 of us have, that we sit here representing people from across this country. As Danielle and I took a few moments, we reflected on the significance of what that means and our nation's more than 150-year history. And the phrase that kept coming to mind, that I repeated often throughout the election, was the short statement that's in Section 91 of the uh, um, Constitution Act of 1867, and that it is that the House of Commons to make laws for the peace, order, and good government of Canada. And although that talks uh, uh, primarily about delegated authority, when I would, uh, over these last seven, eight months, spend a lot of time campaigning, talking with Canadians, talking with the people of Battle River Crowfoot, time and time again, the primacy of why, we're, why we are here is that to ensure that we have peace, order, and good governance, and the responsibility that that is for each and every one of us, representing our many uh, constituents, the diverse regions that make up this country, that we would all work towards in the midst of, of what often will be uh, differences on, on policy items, sometimes passionate differences. As we work in a unique minority parliament where, uh, where there has to be a level of working together to some degree, that we would all strive for that which is peace, order, and good government. So, Mr. Speaker, I would be amiss if I did not go through a few thank yous. And I want to get to the people of Battle River Crowfoot here in a minute, but first, I need to say thank you to my family. Danielle, my wife, an amazing life partner. The, uh, the support she has been uh, o over these last eight months in this adventure called a campaign, a nomination campaign, and now as a, as a Member of Parliament, the early months of a Member of Parliament. Thank you so much to Danielle. And my two boys, Matthew and Emerson, very, very proud of them. And although they're, they're, uh, they're, they're excited at the fact that Dad gets to now work in a castle. It's, uh, you know, they're a little young to understand the dynamics of it, but they like the fact that I work in a castle. It's a lot of fun. My, uh, my larger family, my, my dad, my, my siblings, aunts and uncles, and especially when you come from a farming family, you have a real understanding of the significance of what family is in a situation like this. So thank you to my family. And I want to specifically mention a huge thank you to two, that, uh, uh, to, to two individuals. My late grandfathers, that uh, throughout their lives were such an encouragement to me, Jim Hutchings and Felix Couric. The fact that they demonstrated so well, in very different ways, both of them very, very different people, but they demonstrated so well what it is to be Canadian and all that that represents. My one grandfather, Felix, a life, a, a, a career in the energy industry. My grandfather, Jim, Jim Hutchings, a career farmer, demonstrated well what it is to be Canadian. I need to say thank you to my campaign team. We had, at, uh, by the end of the campaign, more than 200 people that participated in the, uh, the, the, the nomination and then election campaign, and it was incredible to have all of these people involved in the democratic process, so thank you to my campaign team. 
my office staff, some of, with, some of who I've worked with before and some who are new. I just want to want to say thank you to them, especially over these last uh, uh, weeks as, as I've been learning the, the ropes as a member of parliament for all the support and effort that they've put in. I want to also say thank you to my predecessor, Kevin Sorensen. He demonstrated well, yes. <laughs> Kevin demonstrated well what it is to be a strong representative, a principled voice for East Central Alberta, and just a principled good guy. Yeah. And I appreciate Kevin, his friendship and his mentorship, and, uh, and I'm glad that he's still quick to offer me advice, even though I'm now the one sitting in the chamber, and he's, uh, he is, is both farming and taking, I think, some well-deserved rest. Now, I want to talk about the people of Battle River Crowfoot and my response to the throne speech and the amendment that we have brought forward as the Conservative caucus. They go hand in hand. I'm a fifth generation farmer from the constituency of Battle River Crowfoot. And over these last seven or eight months, I spoke to thousands, over 10,000 people that are faced with the reality of the country in which we live. And I need to say first, thank you to them for the honour to represent them with a strong mandate in this House, to be able to be their voice in Parliament, making sure that the concerns, the issues, and all that, uh, that, that makes up Battle River Crowfoot, that, uh, that 52,000 square kilometres of East Central Alberta, to make sure that they get represented in our capital. I take that so seriously. And I say thank you to them for this honour. And as I travelled over these last eight months and continued uh, connecting with the people in Battle River Crowfoot since the election, I hear a consistent message that they're frustrated, that they are not content with the status of where our country is. And as a proud Canadian, that's difficult to hear. We've heard a number of speeches from, from, uh, from some of my colleagues that have touched on this, but the level of alienation that is being heard is real. And I would urge members opposite to take it seriously, the fact that there are lifelong proud Canadians that feel like their country is not serving them. That's a problem and something that needs to be acknowledged and that unfortunately was not acknowledged in the throne speech. Speaking with energy workers, people who have spent a career in the oil and gas sector that have given up hope. And let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, the reality is, is that these people are proud of the work they do, including the world-class environmental standards which they work hard to preserve each and every day. Exactly. They were not recognized. They need champions. Yet. Unfortunately, this throne speech does not even acknowledge them. The agricultural industry, I myself being a fifth generation farmer, proud of the legacy that that means as stewards of the land in Alberta's special areas. Yet, you have producers that have faced the devastating consequences, and let me outline a little bit of what that might look like for a, uh, for a producer, a farmer. You go from canola at $13 a bushel to $9 a bushel. That has a devastating impact on a farmer's bottom line in what is an industry that already has very slim margins. We didn't see those issues addressed in the throne speech. Yet, the government seems to brag about their relationship on the international stage when they're literally being laughed at on late night television. You know, when I talk to other business owners and people within my constituency, they are all so close, so very close to giving up hope. And Mr. Speaker, that is devastating for a proud Canadian, whether it be manufacturing, whether it be those teachers, nurses, doctors in our small communities. Because if they don't have strong communities, those institutions cannot thrive. So, Mr. Speaker, seeing that my time is nearly done, I look forward to answering questions, but I would simply conclude once again to say I am so honoured to be the Member of Parliament for Battle River Crowfoot. So I thank God for this country and 
it is such an honor to be able to, to participate in this democratic process and all that that means for um, the future of Battle River Crowfoot and this nation. Thank you very much. Questions and comments. Question and commentaire, the Honourable Member for Burnaby North Seymour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to thank the member from Battle River uh, Crowfoot for his speech and, and welcome him to the House. <clears throat> I heard him speak about energy workers, and certainly in my riding of Burnaby North Seymour, I have talked about uh, the plight of energy workers in Alberta. In fact, my riding being at the end of the Trans Mountain Pipeline that has started construction, we can hear the pile driving happening from my house. It's happening right now. Uh, we've had over 500 days of protest in my riding over the last four years that I've been a member of Parliament. And so now that TMX is under construction, will this member support meeting our climate change targets and support the other underlying issues that my constituents are concerned about? Will they support the Ocean's Protection Plan and making sure that we have world-class oil spill response? And most importantly, will he support the residents on Burnaby Mountain that's getting an expanded tank farm, 600 metres from an elementary school, next to tens of thousands of students at SFU and a growing community at university? And will he support the Burnaby firefighters and make sure that the investments are made so that we have world-class facilities to keep those people safe? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Honourable Member for Battle River, Crowfoot. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I look forward to being able to answer the question, but I would premise it by saying this. I have a, a constituents that have, are developing world-class spill response technology, yet they can't even get a meeting with the minister from the other side. Right. Right. So they talk about wanting to care about the environment when we have energy industry, energy investment fleeing this country each and every day. Right. Here, here. Canada is a world leader in, in sustainable, environmentally friendly e energy production. I see it every day. And the people within my constituency are proud that they are, are, are on the cutting edge of that, yet that government has all but abandoned them. Now, I hope that pipeline gets built, and its terminus, I understand, is in the, the, uh, the constituency of the member that asked the question. However, it needs to be understood that that pipeline, among the others that the Liberals have either abandoned or cancelled or whatever the case may be, we even saw this morning an announcement that more energy investment from, that was sl at first slated for Canada is being used in the Gulf of Mexico. Right on, yeah an abandonment of Canadian energy. We need to make sure that we support the world-class, including environmental world-class um, industry that we have here in this country. And I hope that pipeline gets built, but quite frankly, with the record of the members opposite, until oil starts flowing through it, I don't believe it for a second. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The honorable member for St. John. I was listening to my colleague talk about the problems faced by producers and crop yields which are difficult and going down. Well, we have the same problem and uh, uh, we suddenly got snow three weeks early, and this is due to climate change. Does my colleague recognize that climate change can be due to an increase in greenhouse gas emissions, including um, due to the oil sands? And does he recognize that uh, we must help our producers, um, but uh, that, is, that, that is contradictory with um, um, the oil sands? forward to being able to answer the question, because like her constituency, where there are producers in her constituency that are facing uh, unpredictable weather patterns and whatnot that are affecting their yields, the same is the case in many places across the country. So we need to make sure that there are strong supports for our agricultural sectors. But let me take a moment to describe how producers in this country are on the cutting edge of making sure that we have the most sustainable uh, crop production in the world. Things like zero-till technology, right. genetic re genetics research that will ensure that, uh, that our crops can grow in a variety of climates. Mr. Speaker, we are a country filled with innovators, and instead of, of, of I, I think, all the other parties in this House supporting a carbon tax with, which punishes Canadians, let's support innovations that empowers them to find solutions that not only benefit us, but truly change the world. So I'd encourage the member opposite to, uh, to uh, be a part of literally helping change the world, finding solutions that make a difference here in our country and around the world that will have a real environmental impact. Yeah. Yeah. Before 